Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. You're watching Indigo Tech Tutorials. In this video, I'm going to show you how to build a t-shirt store using Ruby on Rails. So it's going to be really cool. We're going to build this whole app to sell your t-shirts. So actually, the reason why I'm doing this is because one of my friends wanted to create a website to sell his t-shirts. And he wanted to use Ruby on Rails, which I think is a great idea because you'll be able to learn the technology and also Ruby on Rails is just a great framework for building websites. And building this store page will be a breeze using Rails. Compared to all of the other platforms, Rails just makes it really simple and also secure. So let's get right into it. I'm gonna create the app. So first I'm gonna go into the terminal and then we can create our new Rails application by typing Rails new. And I'm just gonna call it T-shirt sales. Then I'm gonna set the database to PostgreSQL and I'm gonna use Tailwind as the CSS framework. Now that I've set those and I'm gonna run the commands, this will create our Rails app. So I just need to wait a second and it's generating everything. If you look in the logs, it's like doing certain things, but I don't really look at that. It's just kind of nice to see. All right, so now it has went through all the steps and it created our Rails app. So now we can just CD into the app so I called it t-shirt sales. And now that we're inside the app, the first thing we can do is just start the server with bin slash dev, which will allow us to view the app on localhost 3000 in the browser. Then when we get here, we see this active record, no database error. That's because I'm using Postgres. So I have to create the database whenever I start a new Rails app. So for luckily for us, there's a simple button right there on the page where we can create the database. And then now we're seeing the Rails logo, which means everything's set up in our app and we're ready to start coding. So I was talking about with this with my friend and really all he needs, he doesn't even want a home page or anything. He just wants the main page to be the page with all the products. So that's perfect. It makes this a lot simpler. So all you need is a model and I'm actually going to scaffold it. So a scaffold means it's going to create all of the pages and the views for your model. So to do this, we're gonna do a RailsG scaffold command like this, and then we're gonna put the name of the model, which for us will be a product. So we're gonna have many products, and a product will have these different attributes. So I'm gonna have a title, then we can have a description, which will be type rich text. So rich text just means that it's it adds a built-in advanced text editor, which allows you to do stuff like bolding text, adding images, doing quotes, and like all sorts of fancy stuff that you might want. You also don't need this. You can just do regular text. If you don't want to be rich, you can just do description, pull in text. But I think rich text just looks pretty nice out of the box and it has some useful helpers. Then for images, you can just do images and this will be type attachments. So we're gonna have multiple images on the product model. And the last thing is setting the price, which can be typed decimal. Now the reason why it's decimal is because if you want to handle having like a change, so you have a shirt that's $4.99, or like, I guess that's really cheap for a shirt. You might have a shirt that's like, you know, $19.99 on sale or something. So you don't, it's not gonna be 20, it's $19.99. So we're gonna save it as a decimal. And this is really it for our model in this app. So I'm just gonna run enter. Just like that, we generated the product model. And from here, I guess we'll just do a Rails DB migrate to migrate the database. And we can restart the server. Now what that scaffold did is it added this new route slash products. We can go there on our app and now we have this whole products route where we can create a new product. Now, oh, we instantly see this error but it's because we don't have action text installed. So because I'm using action text and active storage, we need to quickly do the config for that. So go back into the console and run Rails action text colon install which will set up everything for action text. And then we just have to migrate the database one more time with a Rails DB migrate. After we do that, now we're good to go and look at the products. So I was on the products page and I clicked new product. So this is the form to create the new product. So let's like put our name of our shirt. Actually, let me look up some t-shirts online and so I can get some pictures and something to use as an example. So any of these would actually work. Let's just get like the title our movies and chill shirt. We can get the description right here. 
drop it into the rich text and then for images so this is the built-in image select and you can just drag like your multiple files right on top of there so first i need to download some images so let me like save these images only burn a couple okay oh i forgot about there's also like these sort of things like the size and the color but we'll get to that later so for right now we're just setting up the basic model which would be setting up like the products then i'm going to drag in my images just like that it says four files selected and then the price how much is it 31 dollars all right just like this 31 dollars click create product and just like that this is our basic simple app this is what it would look like when you first get started so from here it's just about like cleaning up the styling and making everything look better so if we wanted it to look kind of like this website we could get started on that styling so right here is the products show page another thing to notice is that we have like this one in the url so that's what rails uses for the different posts it, like using the id which is just the number that it goes up so like the next product we create would be product two so to make it so that it uses the title inside of the url we actually would create something called a slug for this product and to create a slug there's a few things that you can do but i might just do friendly id which is a gem for ruby that makes doing slugging pretty simple so i think i would like to do that and, and gems if you aren't familiar with ruby or ruby on rails gem is like a little library that somebody built which people use in their apps and then it does some like helpful things that make it a lot easier to build certain features now you don't want to rely on too many gems because uh you know they're built by people so if they stop maintaining it then you might have like an old gem with old code that doesn't really work that well but in this example i think friendly id is fine to use so what we have to do is add it to our gem files so you can do this by hand if we open up the code in the text editor and we go to the gem file right in here we can actually add this line in ourselves so you can put it anywhere that you want although these groups uh like specify certain environments so like only development or only test so i wouldn't put it there i'll just put it overall so let's just put it like up at the top at the top maybe next to postgres so i have the friendly id gem and we can run a bundle in our terminal this will install that gem and we can come back over to the docs it says we need to add a slug column to the table so i need to quickly add that real quick so to add a new column you just do rails g migration and then we have to put in the name add slug to products so that we're just adding this certain field to this model which is called products and then do a space and do slug just like that and it'll default to a string which a string is just a piece of text all right and then we'll do a rails db migrate we now have the slug on the model and then from there we have to run rails generate friendly id so i guess that sets up the friendly id configuration so if you didn't know rails g is short for generate so they just kind of did the long syntax you can also just do rails g friendly id there we go so we have a new migration for friendly id which actually means we have to do the rails db migrate again you'll see it created a table and like a few other things now for the model we need to edit this model and add this these two lines of code extend friendly id and then set the friendly id so we're going to go into the app models folder product and i'm going to add in this code maybe i'll put it at the top because i like having my extends up at the very top and then friendly id instead of name we didn't use name did we use like title i can't remember now let's go back yeah title so that's what we're gonna have to use for our slug friendly id title now in the controller we have to use friendly find instead of find so we have to do is go over to the app controllers folder and the products controller and then go to this before action set product which is all the way at the bottom where we're setting the app product instance variable for a few different pages and for the product.find we just have to add dot friendly find like this 
And I think that does it. So now all new products that we create, it'll set that slug automatically. But for the one that we already have, like that we already have, it doesn't have it yet. So we have to do the save callback. So you can do it just like this, like find each and save to update all of your products. So I'm gonna quickly do that. So to run a command like this on your app, you go into the Rails console by typing Rails C. Now that we're inside the Rails console, you can access the product model. You can do things like product.all to list all the products. You can do account. You can do a lot of cool stuff in here. So Rails console is really fun. And what I'm gonna do is to find each and save to run that callback. And now you'll see if I get the product.last, uh, these are the information, so the title. And you'll see that it converted the title into the slug down here. So this is what it would look like in the URL, which that looks pretty good to me. You can just exit out of here, restart the server, and now we have a prettier URL. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. So if we come back to the main page and then we go to the show the product again, you'll see that the URL is kind of like cleaner. Also, if you didn't want to have this product's text in the URL, we could get rid of that. So it just shows like the name of the t-shirt right here. I think that will look pretty clean, especially for what my friend's looking for. I'm not sure, but you could also change the that route. So to do that, let's go to config routes.rb and we'll, I'll show you how to do that real quick. So on this resources products up here, this is the piece of code that's defining all of your routes for the products uh, model. Now, if we add this attribute called path, we can set the path to anything we want. So it could be like t-shirts. And now this will change the URL. So if we go back to products, now we don't have no route matches get products. So actually we have to go to slash t-shirts, whatever's the path. And then if we show the product, you'll see that it's like t-shirts just like this, uh, you know. So that's kind of cool. You can change the path. And if we just do an empty string, just like this, and boom. Now it actually works like the same as the route. We never set, I mean the route down here. We never set this route, but we might as well do that now. But it's funny that if you just set the path to empty, it'll work the same way as like overriding the route. So this is another way to do it, I guess. You can show products and now you see that our product is going right off of like nothing. But another thing to notice is when we do a new product, it will actually just say like the URL will be new and that could conflict. I mean, it wouldn't conflict unless you have another route that's going on like nothing, a path of empty. So I guess this is fine but I think I might want to split it up. So what we can do is we only want the route to change for the show page, right? So that it'll be like slash this, but only for the show page. So what we can do is let's say resources products, except show, and then we'll do another one, resources products only show, and we'll set the path here to empty. So for the rest of the products URLs, they're gonna stay normal, but only for the show page, we're gonna get rid of that path. And now let's take a look at what this looks like. So if I go back to the main page, we don't see the products anymore. So we have to go to slash products. Now we're on slash products. We can do new product and it looks like this in the URL. But then we go to show the product. That's funny, no route matches yet. Except show. Whoops, so something's wrong. Let's go to the views, products, index. Right here we have this link to show this product. It should be working normal. Cause look, the URL, if we delete the products in the URL, it does work. See, we're on the slash, uh, only the name. There's no products up in the URL. But for some reason, when we click on show this product, it goes to the wrong URL. Oops, just slightly annoying. So when you're debugging things like URLs, a good thing to do is go and check Rails routes. You can run a Rails routes in the terminal and it'll give us all the routes inside of our app. And then we can just look at them and see like how they're defined. So the product path, like the one we're doing, it looks like it is automatically setting it to the one with this namespace. Oh, I see what's happening. It's because of the edit and the update and the destroy, they're all going on the product path. And because we need the namespace, like the helper is kind of weird. 
it's not working. So there's a few ways to do this, but I think the, the simplest one is just to handle edit, update, and destroy right inside of the one with the no path. So what we can do is switch this around actually, so that resources products only new create index and then our one without the path is just going to be only show edit update destroy now we're putting like a lot of stuff here but i think that's fine actually and instead of accept wait it should be only so we're, we're going to define these routes for the new create index and then these routes for show edit update destroy all right that should fix our error that we're having so just make sure that you have the server started again. I'm going to reload. All right, everything looks good. We can go create a new product. We can go back. We can show the product. And look, the URL is working. So it's going to the slash and then the slug. So perfect. This looks good. All right, so let's get into building the actual site and making it better. So this would be your main path. When you go to localhost 3000 with nothing, this is like the main part of your app but we're just showing the Rails logo. So how do we show that products page? Well, we have to set the root of the application. So where we just were inside of config routes.rb. So if we go back in the code, config routes.rb right here, it's a file that looks like this inside of it. And we were messing with the products resources. So to set the root, we already have like the root kind of example down here. So we can just uncomment this and then change it from post index to products index. And then just like that, we've set the root. If we reload, this, would, would, this is what it would look like on our web app. So perfect. Now we have the simple setup, but from here we want to style it. So like right off the bat, this is what the page is going to look like. And I know this is not what my friend wanted for the products page. He probably just wanted to show like the image and then the brand, like the name of his brand. So let's get started on doing that. We can even get rid of all these buttons and everything. Honestly, a good place to start might even be just getting rid of all of the code. So what I mean is on the views products folder on the index, this is the file that we have all that code. It's also, that's also gonna be like the home page of our app. So there's already a lot of stuff in here. Like there's a friggin' link to create a new product. And then we're also rendering all the products. But what we're doing is we're just rendering this partial with like all this content that's not styled very well. So I'm just gonna delete all the code on the index and we can start again from scratch. By the way, I am using Tailwind CSS for the styling. So you have to use dash C when you're creating a new app to set Tailwind as a CSS framework. But if you haven't done that yet, you can always install Tailwind by doing the Tailwind CSS Rails gem and following the instructions for setting it up. Pretty simple. I think there should be a guide somewhere. But yeah, so now when I reload, there's no there's nothing on the home page. There's nothing on the products page. That's empty. So I'm gonna add some content. So I'll add a div and I can do like with full height screen BG indigo 500. So we're just gonna have a box with a background of 500. Let's see what that looks like. If I reload, this is what it looks like. There's a lot of space around it, which I don't really like. So to fix that, I'm gonna go to layouts application file. And we have this main div, which is added with the Tailwind setup, like when we create our Rails app. So I'm just gonna delete this. It is gonna mess up some styling on the other pages, but we can get back to that. And then when I reload, there's no more border. It's just a pink or like a blue indigo background uh, so this is cool and then if i wanted to do a gradient too you can do that with tailwind by doing like a bg gradient to then you have to choose your direction like right left bottom top let's just do it to bottom and it's going to go from a color the so from indigo 500 to pink 400 so tailwind works on like this basis of 100 to 900 with 100 being the lightest 900 being the darkest and then it uses like the various colors. But this is how I do a gradient. So we're going from indigo to pink. And now I'm gonna go ahead and put my, like the title of my app. And for that, I'm gonna use the H1. 
and I'm going to add a class 5XL text center and I'm going to say like fire t-shirts this would be obviously like the name of your brand I don't know what I'm going to call it but that looks good fire t-shirts so it's all the way up at the top I want to squeeze it down a little bit let's go back to that products index page and we could either add padding onto this container or we could add margin onto the header text. I think I want to add just padding on the container. So I can do PT and give it a value like 20. Push it down a little bit. Okay, I kind of want more than that. So maybe like 36 reload. Okay, fire t-shirts. And then maybe let's add a color on this. So text. Maybe go 100. Should be like a really light purple. Okay. And then we're gonna have a P tag. The best t-shirts from all around the world. Or something like that. And I'll give a text large. Text enter, maybe some margin. So this is how you style with Tailwind. I know it looks like a lot when you're first starting. So you might prefer actually using like a CSS file. And you can do that too. Even if you're using Tailwind, you can use a CSS file. What that means is you write your own classes using CSS. And then you can reference them on the page on your element. So we could easily do that too. And that might be even cleaner too. All right, I'm going to change this from Indigo 100 to Pink 100 so it matches. All right, cool, fire t-shirts, the best t-shirts from all around the world. Okay, so now we have this simple homepage with the cool background and the name of the site and a little description, but it might be cool from here to add a custom font. So for my fonts, I usually go to defont.com. There's a lot of cool options that we could choose from. And you can also take the text that you're gonna have and preview it. So first just select a different category of font. And then you could put the preview right here, submit, and then you get a little example of what the font would look like. And then inside of our app, we can add like coloring to change what it looks like from there. I kind of like this blocky text right here. So I'm going to try to download this. I'm just going to click the download button, download the font. Usually it comes in a zip, so we're going to have to unzip that. Let's go take this, extract it and then take the extracted file and we're going to drag it into our app. We can open up the code again. And I'm going to put it inside of not the assets. I'm actually going to use the public folder. So I'm going to create a new folder inside of public called fonts. And then we can put all of our fonts in here. And this way it'll work pretty nicely with our CSS. So I'm just going to take the font drop it in here and I'm actually going to rename it just to like Brooklyn dash chill just so that's a little bit easier to access inside of our CSS. So now I'm going to go up to the asset style sheets application.css. I think we could do it here or we could do it inside of application.tailwind.css. We can do it either place. I guess I'll do it in the tailwind one. So I'll come in here and I'm going to add a font face. So here's where you actually like set up your font. So I'm just gonna call it chill. That's the name, the family name that we're gonna use. And then the source, we're gonna put slash fonts, slash, then the name of the font. We called it, or the name of the file, which was brooklyn-chill.ttf. So make sure that you add the file extension too. And it's gonna point to here. And then inside of our app, this will translate over to the public folder because all of the assets hosted on the public folder are available. So for example, the 500, we could actually go there. That's 500.html. Oh, it looks like we see an error. Or actually, I think that's what the, this is what the styling looks like. <laughs> I just tricked myself. Oh okay, yeah, also 422, let's try that. It might just be the same, 422. Oh yeah, look, the text is different. It's kind of interesting. So this is like the default styling, which is interesting because I think we could change this just right there if we wanted to change that 500. Wow, I never looked in here. 
we can actually change the styling for the error just in case you ever wanted to like have that apply in production which you probably would all right so now that we have this new font added we can use the font family kill on any styling so you could put your own css class i might just do like chill font make a css class like this and then inside of our css file i'll just do it underneath this import for action text i'm gonna do a new class so to do a class in css you just do a dot and then put the name which i call it chill font then put some brackets and then we can set the font family to the one that we configured below which we call the chill and just do it like this and then let's reload and just like that you have your custom font inside of your app now it does look a little bit small so usually when you add a new font like the styling is kind of different so you i usually have to make the styling a lot bigger so for like the font size instead of 5xl i'm actually going to put a custom font size like 300 pixels on this element well actually that's way too much so i gotta kind of experiment to see what's right not 300 but like 64. it's a little bit better maybe we'll go with like 80. fire t-shirts and then also it's like adding a lot of space between the bottom text which is kind of weird so at this point i'm just gonna remove the margin completely see like that barely did anything because this text is just taking up so much space if you highlight it it's like there's all this padding on the top and bottom now I don't really know how to fix that part to remove the margin that might just be a part of styling but one way is to if we really needed to like make this fit a little bit better which I do kind of want to we can add a fixed height on this text so like height 40 and then just do overflow hidden, which means you hide all of the content that goes over the box. So I think 40 is actually a little bit bigger. So if we go 20, reload. Oh, now like we can't even see half of the text. So we're going to have to increase that. 32. All right, that's a little bit better. And if we select, so there's like more styling. There's more padding on the top. And the bottom is kind of just like a little bit. So it is kind of weird. You can mess around with this more, but I think that's fine. Now, I guess I want to add some styling to this P. Maybe we can add like a color on it, make it a little bit bigger. Text to XO. Best t-shirts from all around the world. All right, I mean, I don't know. I might make the text a little bit lighter. Maybe we'll just make it like white buyer t-shirts all right and then now i'm gonna go and like list all of the t-shirts so right, under, right underneath the p we can loop over the products which on this page we already have this products variable so we say products dot each do product now this percent this like carrot percent thing this this is ruby embedded code so you write this whenever you're going to write some Ruby code. So for a loop where we're going to loop over the products, we add this Ruby code and the difference between the equal sign. So usually I do like the bracket percent equal. That means it's going to display the content. But when you loop, you'd never want to do the equal sign. It's always just without the equal sign. And then inside of this loop is where we put the content where we'd use the equal sign like this. So like to display stuff like the product title. So it just means this is actually going to go on the page. So the product title will go on the page. We can get the price. Uh, there's a built-in method called number two currency. That's very handy for converting like a decimal or integer into money. So it adds like the dollar sign and everything. All right, so this is where elements got put. So I'm gonna need to style this more. And if we had multiple products, it would have just like stacked it up in a line. What we can do is we can put a container around this. This whole loop, I'm going to give it a max width, MX auto, so I can kind of center it in the middle of the page. 
Let me reload. All right, now it's a little bit more centered. And then a cool thing you can do when you're coding these apps and you're trying to style the front end is you can add a background on the element that you're adding specs to. So you can kind of see it a little bit better. So like I just added a background on this. So this is what our container looks like right now. It's just like this pink container in the middle of the page. Maybe let me use green so it's a little bit more obvious. Like this green container. Now the inner products, I think I want to style them as like cards. Oh, also let's display an image. So let's do products.images.first. If product.images.any. So if there's any images on the product, we're going to do an image tag for the first one. I'm going to add the image tag just like that. And this image tag, when we're passing in the first image, it'll display that first image. So if we reload, ooh, now we can actually see the image. And you'll see it's pretty big. So I'm going to try to make that smaller. And that's where I'm thinking that we might want to have these shirts organized into cards, like little boxes, with like the title and then the picture. Also, one thing I'm seeing is the size might be a little bit too like skinny for this page. So I can increase this. Yeah, 2XL is pretty small. So let's go up to like 5XL. We have more space to work with. Cool. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this image tag and give it a height. So let's add a class. And we'll do like height 40. And then I'm also going to add object cover so that it covers that height. And then we can also set a fixed width so that it's actually a square. There we go. And then what we can do is on this container, why don't we say add some styling? We're going to turn this into a grid. We do grid, grid calls three. So that's going to make it so that there's three items per like section and it'll space them out. But because we're just displaying all the content here, it actually is like splitting these up. So we need to put a div inside of this loop that wraps all of these items. So there, I put a div. Now everything's kind of in the same spot. And then what I can do is, let's work on styling some more. So I think we can put the image at the top Then we can put the title and then the price. So I can put a span around the title. Reload. Okay, this is cool. And then we might want to put a width on the div. So the image is 40. We could do a width 40. And now it'll kind of wrap the text. So that's cool. And then we could have the price right there. We could put that in like a span or a div. I kind of want to add some styling on this price to make it like a button. So I can add some padding, rounded. And then background. Let me reload. So now we have something that looks like this. Also, at this point, let's remove the green because it doesn't really go with the styling. It doesn't go with the themes. So I just want to, I was just using that as an example for that container. All right. So you'll see that we have this little badge. I was thinking for the price. I don't really like this. It's like a slight rounded. I want to do a full rounding so it looks like a pill. We'll do rounded full. Reload. Now it looks more like this, where it has a perfect round around the outside. And I can add some spacing between this and the title by doing some margin pump. So it looks like that didn't work. Is it because it's not the width? I'm not sure. Let's just add a BR. That'll also add some space. Oh, wait, it didn't work. That's weird. I like margin top six. See this? I wanted it to push away from the text, but it looks like it's not working. I'm not sure why. Maybe because of this element. Do like height full. That looks like too big. Okay, I also want to take away height screen. Do a min height screen. I'm not sure about this. Maybe let's make this image a little bit bigger. Let's use 56. Oh, okay, I think I see what's happening. 
So the text and the price are put onto like the same type of element styling. So actually, we should wrap, we should put on this div, we could add a flex, flex call class. Oh, so now it looks like this. Everything is stacked on top of each other, and now our styling should work better. Also, this badge is a little bit pushed away already. So we don't really need like the margin anymore. But what would be nice is to not have this like how the width's kind of weird. So we could either push it to the left or the right using margin. I think I'm gonna put it on the right side of the div. So to do that, we can add margin to the left by doing margin left auto which will push it to the right we reload now our card looks like this and i think it might look good if we just add like a little background behind the text and the price just to finish off the card look so what we can do is we can add a background on this div we do j 600 reload okay that looks cool and then if i want to like add a little bit of padding on these bottom elements well I could either add padding on both things, or I think I'll do another div. Yeah, another div. Class P2. And then this also needs the flex flex call. Styling. Close off the div. Reload. Alright, now our card looks like this. And then I kind of want to have the edges rounded just a little bit. So on this top level div, we can do rounded large, and then just do an overflow hidden to hide the edges of the images and everything that would go off. And now we get a look that looks like this. So this is cool, although we'd have to make this text lighter. So why don't we make the title like text paint 100. That should have worked. Oh, it looks like I spelled class wrong for you. Let's fix that. All right, cool. So now we have this text of the shirt. We might even want a custom font for this. So we could find another font. And then just do it the same way that we added in the other font. So for the actual like title of the shirt or of the product, It really just depends what style you're going for, like what type of theme you're looking for for your app. I don't really care. I'm just trying to do like as crazy as possible. I guess Fire Blast sounds fun. Let me download this. Fire Blast, we got the zip. Let me extract it. And then I'm going to drag it into my public fonts folder. I'm going to rename this Fire. And then I can go over to the CSS. I'm just going to copy this font base. Okay, just the fire. And right here. Fire. Did we capitalize it? Yeah, we did. Okay, perfect. And then I'm going to add another CSS class. Call that fire font. And set the font family to the fire like we set it down here. Cool, so now we can use this class inside of our code. So right here on the element, you can just add the class fire font and it'll apply that font to reload. Ooh, now we get this nice font down here. And I want to make it a little bit bigger. Let's do text to Excel. Ooh, yeah, I like this. I actually really like that. So when you click on it, nothing happens. So what we want to do is when you click on anywhere here, I want it to take you to this shirt. So to do that, I'm going to wrap this whole div right here inside of a link. You can do a link to the product, and then add do for a block, and then all of that, and then add an end. And just like that, you've wrapped this element in a link. Everything looks the same, but when you click on it, it actually brings you to your product page where you display all the information about the t-shirt. That's pretty cool. Already we have styling on this page. Now we just have to go and style this shirt page. And then that's basically it because uh, the edit page, that's only going to be like the owner of the site is going to see that. Nobody else is going to see these pages. So we don't really have to style it. All we care about is the stuff that the user or like the buyer 
the, um, the person who's coming to your site to buy a t-shirt is going to see. We want to make that all pretty. But the actual forms for you, it doesn't really matter. Oh, one thing I just remembered is on mobile, we need to have some style changes. So like this grid calls three. If we try to do three columns on mobile, it's going to stretch these like divs to like be really weird and small. So we need to change this so that it only applies on medium or bigger. If we reload, now it shouldn't, I mean, oh, now we still have this width of 56. So what we're going to do is I'm going to select both of these width 56s. So on here and the image. Or actually, let's just do width full on the image because since we're using this fixed width, it would already go to this. And then we can have this only on a medium breakpoint. On smaller screens, we'll just do width full so it can take up the full screen. All right, now it looks something like this. Now it's kind of like squeezed against the size so we can add some padding just on this card right here. We can do like PX8 and then medium PX2 or PX0 we don't want padding on larger screens or maybe we do look <laughs> we actually because even on this is a medium screen it, it looks like it could use some padding so all right let's do yeah let's just leave padding x8 or maybe let's switch it to padding 4. sure yeah, that looks good good enough for now all right so we're just going to quickly create a new product we could see what that looks like I'm going to again look on some t-shirts online, trying to get an example used for the pictures and everything. Get this one, Japanese Walkman shirt. Put that, whoops. <laughs> Let's get that image. Alright, so we got these few images. I'm going to have to drag them in. So the thing about the file select right now is you actually need to select all of them at once. You can also click on the field itself and then select images. So that, I mean, that's fine, but we can obviously make a better design for that file upload field so that you can see previews of the images and that you don't have to do it like all at once. You can do it one by one. But that would require some JavaScript to enhance that on the page. All right, I'm also going to grab this description. I think this is the best description right here. And the price, how much is this? 31. It's the same as the other one. All right, create product. Now I'm going to go back to the main page. All right, now we have two different t-shirts right here. $31 each. Pretty cool. I guess from here we can start styling the show page, which is the actual page of the product or the t-shirt. So to do that, we can go into the code inside the views folder and the products and show page. This is where we have all that code for this product. And actually the easiest way to do this might just be to delete all the code and start from scratch. So we can create a div and I'm just gonna try to create a nice cool background and do with full Main height screen, or actually, you know what? I can take the code from the index. Let's copy this and put it on the show page. And I'm just gonna delete this product loop. And I guess I'm actually gonna delete most of it. I just want this background, and then maybe the title. We could replace this with at product dot title, and then underneath we could put the description. So at product dot description and let's go back here and reload this is what we get so we get like this huge text and then the description right here so we can probably try to style this a little bit better instead of doing a p let's do a div and it's because we're using rich text so you can't really use text center we're gonna have to do like a max width 2xl and then mx auto something like that just to put it in the center but we might want to think about how we want to have our page laid out. We might want to have something that looks like this page where we have like all the images and then the title, some reviews, price, and all that stuff. Let's try to set it up like that. So we can do images on the left and then the title can be a little bit smaller, but 
Also, I kind of like the title big, but not like this. That's way too big. So let's reduce this 100 pixel to like 60 pixels. Reload. And we're also going to have to remove the fixed height. So we can just remove that section so we're not taking up all that space. And the problem is it, it kind of looks like the home page too much. It's kind of weird. So let's just remove that font. We don't want the chill font. All right, cool. Now we just have a different font. Maybe we should go on the font and find a whole new font for this page. For like the show page of the posting. Hmm. Let's do gummy bear. That'll work. I'm gonna extract this and I have to drag it into our app. So again, we're gonna go in the public fonts folder with our other fonts that we created earlier. And then we can go back into the CSS. I'm gonna copy a font paste and just change this to gummy bear. And then put the name gummy bear. Although I don't know, was it? Yeah, it was just all in one. Cool. And then we can do dot gummy dash bear dash font in the brackets and add the font family. Gummy or no space. <laughs> it's gummy bear. Then back here on that show page, we'll put font. Or I guess it's not font, it's like gummy bear font. Gummy bear font. That's the class that we created. Uh, let me reload. Cool, we get a gummy bear font. And I want to change the color. I don't really like the pink 100 right here. Let's try like just a bright pink, so 600. Ooh, that's kind of bright. Maybe we'll do a gradient on the text. So to do gradient on text with Tailwind, we have to do BG clip text, then make the text transparent, and then just any background image will now show up inside of the text. So if you want to just do like a BG, a gradient to bottom, and then choose a color, so like from indigo 900 to pink 100. This might look cool. Whoa. Honestly, because it's so dark and light, it just looks like gray. So you can't really tell what's going on. Let me change that up. Okay. It's kind of interesting. So maybe instead of two bottom, let's do two right. That might be easier to just, like see the difference. Although it's from Indigo 500. I don't know why it looks like that. That doesn't look like Indigo 500. I don't know. From blue 500 to red 500. Yeah, like, look, that doesn't look like blue to red. There's just, like, something a little bit off. But I think it might just be... Oh, I think I know what's happening. So this element's, like, taking up maybe a lot more space, and that's just the visible part of the gradient. Hmm. Another idea is, what if we don't do a gradient, but we actually put an image as the background? I love doing that, and I think that would look sick if we put, like... Oh, look, so when I get rid of the color, you actually can't see it because of the text transparent. But it's okay, because I'm gonna... We're gonna add an image, and we're gonna be able to see it again. So for free images, I love to go to unsplash.com, because they have a huge collection of images. You just look up whatever you want to find, for me, I want to find some clouds. And already, we just have tons of clouds, and they're really high quality. We just grab one of these, and then we're going to bring it into our assets folder and the images folder. You can just drag it over inside of here, and then I'm just going to rename it to clouds so it's easier to reference. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it right here. So instead of doing class, I'm going to add style, background image, URL. And I'm going to put the URL in here. I'm actually going to drop this down to a new line. It's still a little bit easier to read. And inside of the URL part, I'm going to add an asset path for clouds.jpg. And that's how you set the background image. We come back in here and reload. Now we have an image as the text, like a background image inside of the text. I think that looks really cool. You can do more stuff, like you can do anything you would normally do to an image. So you can do object hover. I'm 
I changed something, I don't know, it didn't really change much. Then we can do object top. So that's gonna like show more of the top of the image. Though I also I didn't see anything. Object bottom. Maybe that's not me. Oh, it's BG. Because we're using background, I'm not it's not an image. The BG cover. Oh, that changed something. How about BG top? Yeah, I don't know how to I don't know how to center in on like the top of it actually for a background image. But this is fine. I mean I can't really see anything. That's the only problem. Maybe we can try a different image. Or we can do like I think you can add percentages too, like 50%. Maybe. That changed something. Put it in brackets. Oh, look at that. It kind of zoomed out. EG 100%. Oh, look at that. It's changing. 200. Oh. Yeah, that's kind of fun. We can mess with this until it sits at a spot that we like. Japanese Walkman shirt. Okay. Oh, but then when you resize it, like, totally moves. That's crazy. Because there's just an image behind it. I mean, that's kind of fun. And then we just have this description that's right here. It looks kind of weird. We could probably position it to the side. So let's put this, let's do everything else beneath this title. So we have the title. That's good. Now let's add like, cause so we have this whole max width. So let's just get rid of that for now. And let's do a div. That's going to wrap this. We can do grid, grid calls two. And let's do it only on the medium breakpoint, just so we can handle mobile right off the bat. We're gonna have two grids side by side. That's what this is doing. Like we're gonna have two boxes side by side on the page inside of this grid layout. So inside of the first div, or like the first box, we can put the images. So let's loop through all the images. We do uh, product.images do image. And then what I'm actually gonna do is I wanna make something like this where the small images are on the side. And then the big image is right here. And then you could go and like loop through them. Although I guess you still have to go through all the images and then just have like the highlighted one first. So let's do that. Let's just loop through all the images. Let's say product images each do. And then do an image tag for the image. Just like that. And then we can add some styling because it's going to be really huge. So let's do like width 40. High 40 or actually 40 is kind of big so let's do 20 and then the object cover and take a look at what that looks like let's reload okay now we have all the images so that's cool i kind of want to space these out though because they're all squeezed together and also like move it i actually want to move everything because look now our title is over to the left so we're going to want to fix that let's come back in here check out the a oh look i accidentally did a typo in the text center so that'll fix the text now down to this grid we're going to want to figure out how to position this better if we look at here it looks like we could just take advantage of some padding on the left so on this grid we could just be like a px8 and then that would push it away from the side of the page but now to separate the images we need to add some styling on this container around the images we can just do a class Let's do grid gap four. So if you do grid without the grid calls, that means there's only going to be one per, like it's just going to be one. They're going to stack on top of each other, and then the gap will separate them. So if we go back, reload, now we have the separated images, and also it's kind of pushed away from the side of the page. That looks pretty good to me. And then see on mobile, it even drops down a little bit, so that's cool. And then let's put the big image right here next to it. So to do that, we're just going to have another image tag for like products dot images dot first. And then we can add some styling on here. It's like width 40, height 40, object covers, can be twice as big. You can reload. Oh, and it's actually down here on the bottom. So because we have this grid layout, so I'm actually going to bring this outside this div and then add another 
container because we're still going to need to position this on the left inside of the parent's grid. We're going to add a div here. Really, we just need a simple div. And put this off. And then inside of here, we can do flex as the sort of styling that we're going to use inside of here. So now it's going to look just like this. We might want to put some padding between. Oh, another thing to notice is on mobile. Look, when we when we bring the size down, this image is actually like taking up. It's on the top, and then the images are on the bottom. So we can do something like that too. I think that's a good idea. So let's reload. It looks like there's a little bit of space between this big image and the small images. Let's add that. So on this big image, how about we add gap right here? Gap eight. We're gonna add some padding. And then I kind of want this image to take up like a lot more space. So let's change it from down here on width 40. We can just change it to like, let's get rid of the height and let's just change it to width 64. Whoa, that's huge. Width 40. How about just like with full? What would that look like? With full. And what if we give it a height 64? Kind of tricky because I feel like it resized. Oh, this actually kind of seems right. Now let's just do like height 80. Maybe bigger. Maybe that's a tricky thing. We're gonna have to get into like the custom values. I'm just gonna do 300 pixels. What would that look like? Oh, that's still a little bit too small. 400 pixels. All right, that seems right. So we have the image, although it's still kind of cropped a little bit. Like you can't see the full thing. That's gonna be a problem. You can do object fit, and I think that'll make it fit inside of. No, that's not working. Um, 56. No, this is the wrong page. Back to the show page. Yeah, this is a lot more than that. 450. All right, now at least we can see like the full image on here. They actually have it like a lot larger. That's yeah, tricky. I want to do like maybe with 500. Yeah, I think this is fine. Let's just leave it like this. And now a little bit of JavaScript that we're probably going to have to do is when you click on the image, we want to change the big image. So let's just go ahead and implement that real quick. It's going to be a little bit of JavaScript that we're going to add. So let's add a stimulus controller by going to console, typing in Rails G stimulus. And we'll just call this like images or like image. Yeah, I don't even know, like image preview, previews, image preview, let's leave it like that. All right, so we're gonna do image preview controller. Let's do bin slash dev. Now right here on the page, uh, we're gonna have to wrap the JavaScript. I think we're gonna do it in this div because it'll wrap both images. We're gonna do data controller image preview. And then we're gonna have a target so this image, the big image, you can just do a data image preview target. Let's just call it big image. Put this on new line. This is how you hook in the stimulus. We're gonna add a data attribute with the name, which is the image preview. So you can do it like this. And then this other, so the small image, we're gonna just add another data image preview target. We can just do small image. Or actually, we don't need a, we don't need a target for this. All we need is an action. So whenever you click on the image, so to do that, you just add a data action. Then we put the event, which is going to be click, then do an arrow, and then we put the name of the controller, which is image preview, and the method that we're going to do. So you do a pound sign, and then the method, which would be like let's just do show image. Now we have to go define this show image method. So we do that over here in the JavaScript controllers and then our new image preview controller is right here. So first thing I'm gonna do is add our target. So you decide it 
static targets big image. So we have this big image target, and then I'm going to rename the connect method to our show image method. And we can just do inside of here, well, let's get the event. So we can pass the event like this with E, or we can call it event. I'm just going to call it E. And then off the event, we're going to get the E.target. And I want to get the URL of the image. So if we inspect this element right here, like this image right here, we can see that it has this source attribute that has the URL of the image. So all we have to do is just swap the big one with this source, and it's pretty easy. So we can grab the source like this, and then we can just say this dot big image target dot source equals e dot target dot source, and then we can even do a check like if not e dot target dot source return, which would prevent any like just in case you click on an image and it's not available, like there's no source then we would just return and we wouldn't update the big image. But this part's not really that important. Now let's test this out. Let's reload. And I'm going to click on a small image. Yep, look at that. It works great. Now let's handle the mobile. So I want, look how these images look pretty terrible. So I want to put those underneath the big image. So to do that, we just need to have flex call on this class and then on medium, we go flex row. Reload. Bam. Oh, actually, <laughs> there is a little bit of more styling we're going to have to do. Instead of flex call, we need to do flex call reverse so that the big image is on top. Reload. Okay. And then also, we have to change this image, this grid right here. So we need to do grid calls four and then medium grid calls one. So look, we have our four on small, but then we go up to big size, then we have the medium. Actually, medium might even be like, like you can't even see them on medium. So we might need to move that breakpoint to like a large. Although without the console, it's fine. But I think this looks good anyways, whatever we have right now. We have the images on the left, and then we have the description here, so that's fine. Let's make sure that we have the title. Oh, the title's here. It's kind of easy to lose because of the, because of this image. This looks crazy. Let's try to replace the image real quick. We'll look up like cyber something cool. This looks crazy, but it's not a free one. How about this one, like a computer thing? Let me download the image. Drag it over into my assets images folder. I'm going to rename it to cyber. And then inside of show, let's just change it from cloud JPEG to cyber JPEG. Reload. Oh, that looks sick. Yeah, I like that. Japanese Walkman shirt. So we have a slightly different style than theirs, and I'm fine with it. We just have this big select for all the images. We have the text that looks cool, the description. Now, we could probably style the description, like, let's try to center it at least on the corner, like, but honestly, it's fine. It's also fine, right? Maybe make it a little bit smaller, like, put it on a single XL. A 2XL is cool. All right, let's go ahead and put the price. So let's show the product uh, price, and let's put that in a number to currency method. Wrap it in a span, and then we can do, like, a text to XL. And then probably think of like some cool font or some cool color to put the price in. Let's reload. All right, price. Oh, we're actually gonna have to put this inside of like a container because we still have that grid container around this element. Let's do a div. That's fine. Reload. All right, cool. Now we have something that looks like this, and you can kind of see where we have to do some styling improvements. So the description has a little bit of padding, I guess just because of the rich text, but the other one doesn't. So let me just put padding on this element. Let's do like a P4. And yeah, I wanna make this price maybe like lighter. Let's try Indigo 200. And then I kinda wanna add padding on this just, be, just to make it line up with the rich text. 
Although I don't know why there's like margin on it. If I inspect. Yeah, there's just like margin on this kind of. Oh, because it's LI, I see why. Because in the it's just get the back end. Let's go and look at the other one. And it's gonna look kind of different. Yeah, we shouldn't have the padding there. Leave the padding, it's gonna line up. Maybe I'll do a semi bold on the price. Oh, semi bold. Cool. Thirty one dollars. We have the whole like description. We might have colors and stuff, but this is like kind of like a basic layout. I think at the bottom we might even show like similar shirts. Why don't we do that? Or like we'll just link them to our other shirts at the bottom of the show page. So let's go outside of this grid. Let's just do another container. And we can do like an H3. Starts to Excel. View our other shirts. Reload. All right, so it's like right down here. We're gonna have to definitely do some styling. Let's just do text center. And then text indigo 500. And we're gonna need like a custom font. Or let's do indigo 100. Sticks out. Ooh, and let's do margin top 10. Push it down a little bit, and let's add the let's add the gummy bear font on this gummy bear font. Whoops! Oh, that looks cool. You have to make it a lot bigger. So view our other shirts, and then under here we'll just have a list of the shirts. Let's do a div grid. We want to do maybe we'll do flex flex wrap gap four. It's another variation to the grid calls, but it's more like chill. So there's no specified limit per of columns. And inside of here, we're gonna find those other shirts. So to find the other shirts, we can just do like a product dot where dot not. So we're just gonna find all the products where the ID is not this product dot ID. And there we go, we have all the other shirts. If we wanna only get a certain amount, we do like the first four. Then we can loop over them. So each new product. And then we just do like our little card here. I'll just do div. Put maybe the image. Product that image is not first. We can do the check, because if we don't if there's not an image, then this will actually like break, I think. If product.images not any. Underneath here, we could put the product title, reload, and see what that looks like. Oh, so we are going to need some styling on the image. Do that with class, width 40, object cover. Let's do a fixed height too, height 40. Reload. All right, and this is what we kind of get. So this is the only other shirt. And let's go ahead and put some padding and center this too. So on this div, on this flex div, let's add a max width 5XL with full MX auto PX8. Let me look at where we did the other PX8. Okay, so we left that. We didn't even do a breakpoint, so we always have PX8. So I think that's fine to do on this one too. And then our inner div, I think this will be fine. We could do a span around this real quick, title. We can make it like brighter and larger. Reload. Oh, oh, I'm not seeing it weirdly enough. I see the image, but I don't see the title underneath. Like there's, it's almost like the page got cut off or something. It's supposed to have this title. <laughs> Where's the title? Oh yeah, look, there is like something kind of blocking it. I wonder, is it my screen? It might just be my screen. No, it's not. Or let's put it back. It might have just been my screen. Reload. Yeah, it was my screen, but still, 
You know what we should do is we should add some padding. You see how we have padding top 36? Let's just change that to padding Y so we have a bunch of padding on the bottom. There, now we have a bunch of free space to go scroll down. All right, this is cool. We have like this card right here. We might want to have this text wrap around. Might be a good thing to do. So on this width, why don't we do, why don't we not even do a, like a fixed height? Let's just do width uh, 56. Let's do this on the parent too. So right up here, we can have width 56 and now the text should wrap too. Reload. Okay, that looks pretty good. And then when you click here, we'd want it to go to that shirt. So to do that, we just wrap this whole div right here inside of our loop. With a link to product do indent this and add an end. There we go. Now we have the link to the other shirts. So now we can this is kind of fun. We can go and link to the shirts that we have in our app. This is actually pretty cool. This is like a simple setup for a t-shirt store. We have the main page with all of our shirts and then we can link to them. We can see our other shirts. Now it gets to the fun part where we're going to accept payments for these shirts so we can have orders. All right, so to accept payments in our app, it's actually super easy using Stripe. So to set up Stripe, first just go to stripe.com and then you're gonna to wanna to create an account. Just sign up with your email and everything. And then once you're in here, you can create, so you can have multiple Stripe accounts or like Stripe businesses inside of one account. So I'm gonna create a new account. They call it account, but it's just off my one account. I'm gonna call it uh, t-shirt business, t-shirt sales, click create. And then it'll bring you to this new account where it's going to be using test data by default. And then to accept payments, you have to just finish your business profile, which means you have to give them some information about yourself and your business. So like phone number and like address and everything. But we don't need to get into that right now. We're just going to worry about setting up Stripe so that we can have payments working in our app. And then once you go to production, you need to, of course, move to the real data and then you'd swap out the keys, but we can test locally and we can also use test cards, which will allow us to make purchases on the site and just make sure that everything's working locally. So to do that, really first, we just need to get these keys, but I'm going to jump straight into the docs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look up Stripe, check out, I think just embedded. I'm trying to find the docs, okay, embedded form. Yeah, right here, this is the page. So it's a quick start for the Stripe embedded form. We're gonna use this. So all we need, first we need the gem inside of wrap. So to do that, you already saw that earlier with friendly ID. Oops, I'm gonna do bundle add Stripe. To add Stripe to the gem file. And doing it this way, it's good. So we can restart the server. And now, Oh, we do need to set the API key. So this is our private key. We're gonna set this inside of our app. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna go and create an initializer. So in config initializers, I'm gonna create a new file called stripe rb, stripe.rb. And inside of this file, I'm gonna add this code to set the stripe API key. It's gonna to go to the rails application .credentials.dig stripe sk. So that's going to be the secret key. Uh, so we're going to go and create the credential file. So inside the terminal, we're going to run editor equals vi. So that means vim, which might be kind of confusing for beginners. So I don't know if you should do that, but you can do nano. Nano is like easier to use when you're just starting. And then we can run Rails credentials edit dash dash environment equals development. This is gonna create the credentials for the development environment. And now that we're inside of Nano, the cool thing is it tells you the commands down at the bottom. So like when it gets time to exit, it's just a, I think that's control X. That's what the up bracket means. So that's like easier to do than the other program. We're gonna do stripe colon and then, then do a new line 
and put FK. And then we're going to put the, S the secret key. So we get the secret key back here in our dashboard. So it's right here. I'm going to reveal it, copy it, drop it right here. So now we have the secret key. We're also going to add the public key, which I'm just going to write PK. Whoops. And I hope I didn't just delete something uh, from that side. Let me see. No, it ends in M. I think that one ends in M. Yeah, so we're good. We're just going to put PK. Wait, what the heck? Why is it doing that? Okay, I don't even know what was happening. There's like a glitch. So maybe Nano is not the best. I'm going to copy the publishable key. Paste it in. All right, and then let's just get out of here. I really want to get out of here. So just control X. And then it's going to say save bonafide buffer. So you can press Y. And then it says file name to write. Just press enter. Okay, yeah, I kind of hate it in there. Oh, finally, I'm out. So now we have credentials, which means our Stripe will work from here. So that's good. We can restart the server within slash dev. And now we can continue through here. So create a checkout session. This is going to happen in the back end in a controller. We're actually going to post to the server to create this session. So we're going to need a dependency for this called request.js. So we're going to run dot slash bin import map pin at rails slash request.js. There we go. Now we have request.js so we can make the request to the server. And we're also going to need a page to show the form. So like a page that we're going to bring the user where it's going to show like the checkout form. Uh, so we might make a purchase page. I think that would make sense. So to do this, let's go in the config routes.rb. And let's take a look at our setup. So we have these resources for products. We can kind of choose how we want to, where we want to have this path. So we might put it, we could put it in the products controller, but then it just might be kind of messy because these methods are kind of big. So I almost want to make a new controller for the purchases. And I'm going to choose, so let's not do it on the one with the path, set the empty because you know, these are just, that, that means that this is only for the show page, right? But also edit, update, destroy. But it means that the, the initial path is just blank, which actually we might want to do it on this one now that I think about it. Let's do a do. And then we can do a resources. Or how about just a resource purchase? Only show. So we're going to have this show action for the purchase. And it's because it's a resource, we're not actually going to pass in like a record here because usually it would expect an ID in the URL. But if you do a resource singular, it doesn't need the ID. So we're going to have the resource purchase. Because we're doing singular too, we need to set the controller to purchase. Not because of the singular resource, but because of the singular controller name. Now I'm saying like purchase instead of purchases, which it usually thinks I would. All right, cool. So now we have this purchase. I also kind of want to nest it inside of a products folder, but because we only have one other uh, controller right now, I don't think it really matters. So let's just do it in, this, in the main controller section. So let's create a new file and we're going to call this purchase controller.rb. And inside of there, we can put a class purchase controller which inherits from application controller. And then on here, we, we said we're going to use a show action. So we'll just have the show. And what we're going to do is we're going to define, or we're going to find the product. So at product, actually, we're going to use the same code we had inside the products controller. Why don't we just bring out this whole method? So I'll copy, including the private, because then I can put it down at the bottom. And then we can just do a before action that product. So now we don't even have to worry about setting it in the method. We'll just have this show. And inside of here, well, we might actually want to have a purchase 
model. I think we will purchase model. So purchase would allow us to just have some sort of record of the sale inside of our app. Although I don't, I don't think it's really necessary. Let's forget that. Let's not do a purchase right now. Let's keep it super simple because Stripe is already going to create a record on your dashboard in Stripe. So we don't really need to store it internally right at this moment, but we might, if we ever want to add like user accounts and then let them see their previous purchases, then it would kind of become more of like a thing. Okay. Start the server. This looks fine. We have the purchase controller. Oh, now let's create the view. So inside views, we have to create a new folder called purchase. And then we create a file called show.htmlderby. And inside of here, we'll put the code for our purchase. So I might even copy some code from, oh, that's a lot of code, maybe the index. I just really want the background is all. <laughs> I don't want like most of this. The best t-shirt. Oh, you know what? I kind of also want like a mix of the show page. If we could grab that, that cool title, that kind of cool title, bring it back over here. And see it's using product title and then inside of here we do want product description reload all right and then now it's time to add the purchase button too on the product show page so let's take a break from purchase show page go back to product show page and add in this quick link so the link should go i think it's tricky so should it go under the price but above the description I think yeah we can go right in between these two elements let's do a div I want to do flex justify center but I want to really put this link right in the center and then we can do a link to purchase now and then for the path we're gonna put would be product purchase path passing the product let's just see if this works freeload oh it does work so there, so that is the path let's go ahead and style the link so I'm add a class let's do a gradient do a gradient to write from indigo 500 to uh, I don't even know. Blue 500. Padding to rounded large. Text indigo 50. Take a look at this. It's kind of smaller than I was expecting. Maybe let's do text XL um, with 40 text center. With 40 is going to be kind of small. Maybe with 80. Ooh, that's and then make sure text center is spelled right. Now we have this kind of larger purchase now. Almost want to do like a PY3. There we go. We have this big purchase button. It's easy to see. Oh, and when we click on it, it says couldn't find product without an ID. Oh, because we we're trying to use ID. Let's go back to purchase controller. We we're trying to use an ID when because it's nested, it's going to be product underscore ID. Reload. There we go. Oh, that's funny. Look, we're just displaying product description. I think. Oh, I forgot to use the embedded Ruby. You need to add this bracket percent equals to display this on the page. So it is the description. Although I don't even know. We might even not want the description right here. Because this is the purchase page anyways. So let's just put the in the text the, or the title of the shirt. And then we'll put the image. We do an image tag for product.images.first. Let's add, add some styling. Or you know what I actually want to do is I want to have the payment form on the right side. And then the image on the left. So to do that, let's add a container give. 
I'm going to do grid, grid calls two, and let's add the median breakpoint. And so on the left, we'll have this image, which do like a width. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I don't even know. Width 80, object cover. All right, it doesn't really matter. And on the other side, we're going to do our stripe form. So we're going to need a stimulus controller for this. You can do data controller. I'm going to call it just stripe dash form. That's a good one. And let's go back into console. I'm going to generate our stimulus controller. So we can type rel g stimulus stripe dash form. This will create our stripe form controller. And then inside of JavaScript controllers stripe form, we're going to import post from at rel slash request.js. And inside of connect, we can make this, I think, async. And then the funny thing is the JavaScript that they expect, if we go to checkout.js, they kind of want us to define this method and then pass it into checkout. So if we take a look at what's happening, we're creating our checkout which with fetch client secret, but we're going to have to replace this code here because that's not what we're doing. But it is kind of simpler. It is actually really similar. So let's leave the, the last part. Except for JSON isn't going to be a method. It's going to be just like an accessor like this. And instead of fetch, whoa, we're going to do await post. And then we're going to have to pass a URL. So I'm going to use this URL value. And we can do static values. I'm going to define the values. So we're going to have URL if you type string. <laughs> we're going to have to get this URL from the HTML. We can pass it in with data stripe that form URL value. <clears throat> so we're going to need a path, an endpoint to hit for the stripe session. And we might as well just put it on the purchase controller. So it'll be separate from the show action. Let's go and define it inside of our routes. So let's go to config routes to RB. And then on this purchase controller, that's what we're going to have to think. So let's do it do. And then let's have a post stripe session to purchase stripe session. I don't know why I'm actually calling it stripe session. I guess because it's a checkout session. I mean, yeah, that's fine. So stripe session. And then we're going to say on, or no, on collection, I think. Maybe. Let's take a look at Rails routes. I'm going to run Rails routes in the console. Do we get okay? So we do have a path now for Stripe session product purchase path. We're just gonna still have to pass in the product. So let's do that right here. Path and pass in product. So now when we do a post, we're gonna expect a method inside of this controller. So inside purchase controller, we're gonna have Stripe session method where we're going to run that piece of Ruby code. So right here. And then we're going to return the client secret just like this. But there is some things, so we're not going to use a price ID. So price ID would be if we created a price, which we could have done with the products, like whenever you create a product, but then you have to worry about syncing a few things around. So it's kind of annoying. Instead, we can add a little bit of other code, which I'm going to take the example from, uh, let's do a new window. I'm going to open recent, go to the Airbnb video. And I'm going to go to the Stripe, or no, it's somewhere in here. Listings, bookings controller, we have the Stripe session method. And I'm going to take an example from here uh, with right here, where we add price data. So instead of just saying price, we can also just say price data. And we can do this. Unit amount is going to be the amount. So to get that, we can take the product dot price. And Stripe uses Stripe doesn't use decimals. It uses 
integers. So what you have to do is you have to multiply it by 100 and then just call 2i. It's will turn to a larger number, but it'll make sure that all of the decimals are accounted for. And then for the product data name, we can set that to the product.title. So now we have this price data here and this will, this looks good. The last thing is the return URL. So where we're going to bring the customer after they have finished paying. So we can create another quick page for that. Uh, we can define it. So I'm going to exit out of here, go back in our code, go to the route and let's define a quick method, which can be like uh, success, I guess this is the success to purchase success on collection. Now we're going to be able to use a similar URL as right here inside of the controller. Let's do this Stripe session, except for instead of Stripe session, it's going to be success product purchase path with the product. Instead of path, we need to use URL because since we're giving it to another app, they need a URL so they can redirect back to our site after. Although the funny thing is, since we're doing an embedded checkout, this doesn't really matter. Although we do submit the form and then they take it to a new page. So I guess it does matter, but they're always gonna stay inside of our app. So let me reload. Oh, this is what it looks like now. So I guess I wanna squeeze these, put them in the middle, add some padding, but I think this looks good with the Stripe session. Oh, just right here where we're returning, we need to change this. So instead of to JSON, we're just going to say render JSON like this. And then also I'm going to indent this code. And that looks good to me. Perfect. Reload. Okay, I want to add padding on this because that looks crazy to me. So on the purchase show, I guess on this grid, let's do a max with 5XL with full MX auto. Reload. And now I'm not seeing the checkout, so I'm gonna inspect real quick. Go to console. Oh, it says Stripe is not defined, right? So an important part of adding Stripe is to add the Stripe to the header. So inside of this example, over here on the script source, you have to add Stripe to the head. So we're gonna do that real quick. Let's go to the layouts folder application. And then anywhere in here, well, anywhere inside of this head element, we're going to put our script to load Stripe. And we can go back, reload, reload, but we're still getting Stripe is not defined. I added it. That's weird. Stripe. Let's look in the JS. Const Stripe. Oh, we need to do this part. We have to actually define Stripe. Let's do it in the connect. Const stripe equals. Now we need the public key. So to get that, um, I usually just stick it in the head and then I just access it with the JavaScript or you could pass it directly. It doesn't really matter because it's going to be public anyways. So if you want to do it in the head, that's one way. So we can do like a meta. I'm going to do it right on top of the script. Meta name stripe public key. And then inside the content, we're going to put the key. Do rels.application credentials.dig stripe pk. We're just going to expose our public key, but that's fine because it's public, so it doesn't matter. Now, to get that inside of our JavaScript, we can do const public key equals document.query selector meta, then do brackets to query for the name. Stripe public key, although did I call it PK or no public key? And then we're going to get the content. Just like that, we have a public key. We can pass it in here, create the Stripe object. And then, oh, the last thing is the mount. So that's going to look for an ID. Instead of that, we can just pass in the element that we're initializing this from. Let's reload. Boom. And there we have a Stripe form. So just like that, we've added payments into our app. Let's do like the name or the email. I mean, <laughs> not the name, the name's on here. And then the test card for Stripe. So if you want to test your payments, 
when you're in test mode, you can just do 424242 two, two, all the way down, and then any date that you want, any name, like any other information that you want to do, any zip code doesn't that doesn't even have to be a real zip code, it's just random numbers. And I reload, oh, the action success could not be found. So I guess on the purchase controller, I never made the success action. So quickly define that. Dev success. And then we also have to add the view. So inside of the purchase folder, I'm going to create a success.html.erb. And then I'm just going to kind of take the styling from the show, put it in success, and then Instead of this div right here, well, actually, instead of the whole grid, I'm going to delete that. We can put the image, that's fine. And then, let's just see what that looks like. Let's reload. All right, so this is what it looks like right now. It's kind of weird. Um, horror movies and chill TV shirt. Maybe I'll do, like, a div that wraps this. Div. Flex, flex call item center that'll like push them in the center of the page at least whoops flash div reload okay center it and then i think i'll just do the message on top so outside of this div let's do another div max with 2xl with full mx auto and then whoops I'm gonna change this from H1 to H2. Maybe make it smaller too. And then we're gonna do our H1 up here. I guess I didn't need a whole dig for this. Text center. Text 5XL. Text indigo 100. And we're gonna do a message like, thanks for your purchase. Reload. Hey, that's sweet. Thanks for your purchase. And then underneath we can have a P, text large, text indigo 100. We will ship this out to you shortly. Although we actually didn't collect our shipping information. <laughs> We're gonna need to do that. It's kind of funny. We should have done that inside the form. I wonder if there's an option inside of the Stripe checkout. There has to be. So let's take a look at this. If we can ask for their like address too. Search address. Check out. How about ask for address in Stripe checkout. To collect an address, pass the billing address collection parameter. Perfect. That's what we needed. To collect a customer's billing address in a checkout session, pass the billing, or no, not to collect a customer's shipping address, pass this shipping address collection. So that's what we need to do. Where is it? I can't figure out where it is. What the frick? More parameters. Shipping address collection right here. When set provides configuration for checkout. So we need to have the allowed countries. Okay, that makes sense, I guess. Unsupported country codes. Oh, so they don't support all of them. All right. Uh, I'm kind of lost. Let's go back to the purchase controller, right? And let's add another method. So next to line items, shipping address collection. And then there's a method called allowed countries. What if I wanted to sell out all of them? Like, I don't really care where you are, right? I want to add, I want to allow all of the countries. I don't care. Everything else. Two letter ISO country codes. I'll do get shipping info for all countries. Great. Right. 
It's annoying because I want to, I don't know, like, I don't want to just tie it down. But I guess for now, let's just put, like, US. And that should at least work. So we didn't get the information here, but let's try this again. So let's go back and let's go and buy a shirt. Our movie. Purchase now. I'm right here. Perfect. Now they asked for shipping address. This is good. So put our guy. Oh wait, this is a full name. Big boy. Address is one two five. Yeah, that works. And part information. Put in the address or the <laughs> the details. Oh, billing info, same as shipping. Yes. Hey, this is already pretty chill. We have a form working inside of our app, and then we get the message. Thank you for your purchase. We'll ship this out to you shortly. All right, now I'll show you guys how you can look at your purchases. So you go over to the Stripe dashboard. And we'll come in here. Let's look at, we should just look at transactions. And look at this, we have two sales right here. And if we wanna zoom in on the sale, we get the shipping details. So as a seller, as like somebody who is shipping out these shirts, you can work on some sort of automation that like, because you can add all sorts of web hooks into your app where as soon as one of these purchases succeeds, you can hit some code inside of your back end. And we could actually handle adding this in a future episode. We'd hit somewhere in the back end and then you could like automate some sort of shipping process. Like if you have something, if you have a shirt in a warehouse, you can tell them that you need to ship it and then you give them the shipping details like we have here. But I think for now, you'd probably be happy enough just to see all your, uh, you know like all of your orders right here and you can go in here click on the order see the shipping details shipping creator like they have that on paypal where you can create a uh, like a shipping thing i don't know if they have that on here they probably have a stripe app though look if you explore stripe apps i bet they have one for shipping yeah look at this they have like a few different ones for automated creation of shipping labels for ups so this would probably be one that works. Parcel craft. Create shipping labels in just one click. 